I mean, what do you do when a client in a fraud case you know, brings in, I know that our friends, some of our friends on the Drabinsky case are here in this room uh, today from the Crown side, but it didn't happen, but I'm saying, what if somebody brought in a second set of books uh, to, to your office, I mean, documents that, that would actually be used by the Crown uh, against you in a criminal case? You're supposed to just, you're supposed to be kind of a, uh, a, a suburban office for the police force um, and, and, or, or working kind of in conjunction with the Crown, I think you have to be very, very careful. I think the presumption is not that it goes over. The presumption is, is let's talk about it. Let's figure out what we have to do and what we're obliged to do. And I think the law is not that clear that you can't work out the problems by working your way through it and coming up with some answer that may have some safeguards for the client. But you primarily, you can't get mad at the client that he's put you in the spot. And you can't get even with the client because he's put you in the spot. It's, it's privileged until you've satisfied yourself as a group that uh, you've got to take some course of action. Bringing it more back to earth then, how about a question when you know or you believe your client may be suicidal? Maybe what? Suicidal. suicidal. So? <laughs> get the cash up front. Well, I, I, I will tell you that, um, and I'm sorry to be so, too anecdotal, some years ago, I remember it was yesterday, um, my client was to surrender, as always on, on his appeal, on the uh, evening prior to the hearing of the appeal, and um, I received a call that, uh, uh, I think that night, that he had not surrendered, and in fact he was at Toronto General Hospital in the psychiatric ward because he had attempted suicide. Uh, so the next morning, and Justice Dubbin was presiding, uh, the next morning uh, the Crown, I advised the Crown, and we went into chambers with Justice Dubbin to tell him that uh, the client had not surrendered, because generally speaking the Court of Appeal won't hear the appeal unless the client surrendered. And uh, I said he hadn't surrendered because he had attempted suicide. And Dubbin started laughing. You know, couldn't believe it. He looked at me and said, you know, something like that uh, happened to me once. He said it was before Chief Justice Robertson and uh, my client uh, had escaped from prison the night before and I had to bring it uh, to Justice Robert, Chief Justice Robertson and tell him that my client had escaped the night before the hearing of his appeal. And Robertson looked at me and said, I guess not much confidence in you, Dubbin. <laughs> and Dubbin then looked at me and he said, and my client escaped. Your client tried to kill himself. <laughs> you know, I, I, I may have been a little glib when I said so, but, but the, the two things that, that I think you know, people are here to learn, and so is not a good enough answer. The two rules are, you're in a solicitor-client relationship. You have no right to know anything from that client, save and accept what the client tells you in the context of a solicitor-client conversation and that is also protected by confidentiality. And I think those are sacrosanct principles. The second principle is, is that as a human being, I think I would do everything I could to talk that client out of committing suicide. And I, I would do everything I possibly could. But the so is, at the end of the day, that's it. Not, that's not just it. I mean, obviously, that's, that's a pretty strong relationship that you've developed with the client. Primary rule is it's a solicitor-client relationship. I, I have another question. I'm not sure if either of you will be able to answer it. You may not have been in before a justice of the peace lately. A what? Um, <laughs> it's a great question. Ethics should be a two-way street. How do you deal with a justice or justices of the peace who will not hold the matter down for a client who is in custody in jail? Some JPs automatically will adjourn a matter at 10.30 in the morning and close the court by 3. And I echo this. I went to two hours outside of Toronto without identifying <coughs> last Friday. Their, their, their court starts at 1 p.m. Uh, my son had an orthodontist appointment uh, that uh, ran a little long. I got there at 1.15. The Crown was aware. I was communicating with the Crown. Uh, on the way there, we were sending letters, receiving letters, in the age of uh, email. 
And at about 1.10, when I was about four minutes away, uh, I was told that the JP is just going to adjourn it over the long weekend if you're not here in a minute. Um, how do you deal with that? You get there. You take one minute and make sure you get there. <laughs> you, you Stunt can't, driving. You, 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 I mean, how do you deal with it? Um, one, you uh, report the JP to uh, the Judicial Council, um, uh, which I wouldn't hesitate to do in that kind of a case. And I don't care whether I'm out an hour, a week, a month, or a year, or 40 years. I would report that judge for that and that alone until someday somebody hears and somebody listens to what's going on in that court. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, that's obviously a big problem. The bigger problem is, is that they lock everybody up. And you, you, by and large, you have, to go for, you have to go for judicial review. You have to go to Superior Court on a bail review to get bail. They, they, they either lock them up or, or, <coughs> or if they let you out on bail, they'll let you out on bail. But you can't have a telephone. You can't, you can't have a, an iPod, whatever the computer stuff is. You can't have any of that. Uh, and, and the rules that are impossible to live by, uh, and, and, and you've, got to, you've got to appeal. This goes on all the time, but it's not like there's no check and balance. The check and balance is, is, is an abusive judge. You report him to the Judicial Council. And, and now, uh, whether it's the Criminal Lawyers Association listserv, uh, it should be circulated so that you get as many uh, additional complaints about that justice of the peace or judge uh, who's acting improperly and abusively as possible so that you bring together uh, complaints to make the complaint have teeth and, if possible, to be endorsed by the association so that you try as much as possible not to be the, the lawyer two years out who's the lone voice uh, against a, uh, a justice of the peace who's acting improperly. It's just now getting to 9 o'clock and uh, people don't know this or some that have come uh, to the series last year absolutely know um, that Brian uh, has been a, an excellent mentor to many, including myself, and has saved my butt on more than one occasion. I finally got to meet his brother tonight, and uh, David told me to uh, acknowledge that Eddie is taller. Um, taller. <laughs> <laughs> taller. <laughs> Um, I was. <laughs> I, said Eddie would, I said Eddie would appreciate it, Brian wouldn't. <laughs> um, but if you had 30 seconds or 60 seconds to turn to the audience with those young in practice, um, tell them what they have to look forward to. All right. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been at the bar 37 years, uh, and the uh, years before that, uh, I was very much involved uh, in the criminal law. So I'm 64 years old, uh, about uh, 44 of those years have been devoted to the practice of criminal law and uh, uh, criminal law defense. Uh, I love it more today than I did 44 years ago. Uh, I wake up enthusiastically and energetically every day, uh, looking forward to my day, looking forward to my work, looking forward to uh, what we can do for people and uh, uh, our very, very important and central place in the administration of justice. It's not just a general uh, principle, it's just not a lofty idea. Uh, it's uh, been my life and I've been privileged and honored to be uh, part of the administration of criminal justice and it's more uh, than just a profession, it's a calling uh, and it's more than just a calling, it's been a hell of a lot of fun. I think when I was uh, 13 years old, uh, and I won't uh, talk about why, but uh, the dream of becoming a criminal lawyer uh, uh, dawned on me at that time, and it's been with me my entire uh, life. Um, and uh, uh, I'm living out uh, my dream. Uh, it may not be exactly what I read about in the famous books by Clarence Darrow or great lawyers of past. They don't talk about the countless hours that you have to work to prepare for a brilliant cross-examination. When I was much younger, I thought you just got up and did it. Uh, and you learn that it's uh, very hard work, but it's very important work. Uh, I, for me, uh, I wouldn't give up being a criminal lawyer for, if they, if they offered me to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, 
I would turn it down to stay a criminal lawyer. Um, there's nothing that I can be offered uh, that would substitute uh, uh, the uh, sense of fulfillment that I have uh, on a daily basis with all of the frustrations and with all of the complexities and difficulties and, uh, and headaches uh, that the practice brings. Uh, to, me, uh, uh, to me, it's exactly where I want to be and, and I'm, I'm happy as I can possibly be and I hope I'm doing it for another 25 years. Well, and I don't want to have, Eddie can have the last word and I gave him the last word, but I want you to know that, that um, there was a panel in November, uh, some of you, some of the younger members of the crowd may have been there and um, someone suggested that it would be, you know, because criminal defense lawyers are the only people in the system that don't have a pension, Judges have pensions, police have pensions, crowns have pensions, we don't have pensions. So wouldn't it be prudent that at an early stage, put money away, save for your retirement? And, and I, I was next speaker and I said, you know, um, I think that is prudent and I don't want to contradict what was said. In fact, it was said by David Bayless, was the person who said it. And I'm not gonna contradict David at all, but if you wanna know my retirement plan, it's called Benjamin's Memorial Chapel. All right? <laughs> And that's what I think uh, is a healthy retirement plan. Why Benjamins? <laughs> <laughs>